All right, good morning. Uh, this is my second time uh, recording this. The first time uh, was pretty long, so I'm trying to try to cut it in half to see if I can make it a little bit shorter for you. Uh, what that means is that I'm not going to go into every nuance of the chapter in detail. It's certainly not going to be as if it was a three hour class or something. Um, I know that you can stop, rewind, you can review both the PowerPoint, the chapter. So I'm going to highlight a couple of uh, issues in this chapter in an in an attempt to sort of add some clarity, and um, and we'll see where it goes goes from there. Now, chapter seven, I will tell you, um, my guess, my assumption is this is probably one of your author's favorite chapters. Uh, because this is the chapter that deals with power, and power is the fundamental concept that critical theorists are concerned with. And the critical theorist will study an organization uh, with the fundamental belief that there are imbalances in power in society that work to elevate some and suppress others, to sub uh, subjugate. And the critical theorist then is about spotlighting those power imbalances on those in those areas in an effort to promote change social change so the theorist almost becomes an activist in a sense so keep that in the back of your mind as you go through this and certainly power is um, is very important your chapter begins as usual by discussing some of the objectives and uh, looking at the perspectives on power, this community power debate, ideology, which was one of the biggest sections of the chapter, and um, the critical perspective. So in terms of general uh, perspectives, uh, the book talks about French and Rabin's uh, five types of power, and they are pretty straightforward. Positional power is based on your title, your, you're the manager, your mother, or whatever. Um, referent power is based on your personality, um, the charisma of your own character. Expertise power is your knowledge and your past experience, so perhaps a title. Reward power is what you can give, pay raises, promotions, um, different types of awards. Um, that you can give to others. Coercive is different types of punishments that you can distribute when certain things are not done. Those are five types of power according to French and Raven. And um, those types of powers do overlap as it says and it is uh, relational. One of the most significant things that's, that permeates well frankly a lot of communication but certainly organizational communication is that power exists only through this dynamic meaning changing process in which the um, relations of interdependence, that, that idea that I need you and you need me, exists between people within an organizational setting. Without interdependence there is no conflict and there is no power. Without interdependence there really isn't any organizational communication. And then we go into some different dimensional models of power and different ways to look at it. There is a one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional model of power. The one-dimensional is um, basically a pluralist model. It argues that power is everywhere in society, um, uh, that all people have it and are part of it, and uh, argues that conflict is necessary in order for that to fundamentally exist. The two-dimensional model of power, a little bit different, and uh, this argues that uh, power exists uh, with a certain class of people, with the elite, and uh, those people have it, and there's a lot of subjugation and and, uh, and bias that exists. The three-dimensional model of power, your author uh, suggests that this is more realistic, more ideal, and it argues that power is really neither good nor bad. It's not positive nor negative. It is something that can be used, a tool in your toolbox, like a hammer. Um, and that it works on a fundamental uh, foundational level that undergirds many precepts within an organization. Uh, now the section on organizational communication and ideology. This is um, probably one of the biggest sections in the textbook and certainly the one that I would hope that you would slow down and read carefully. And, um, and to be quite frank with you, a lot of the concepts about ideology are fundamental to all communication classes. It's the, the fundamental idea that communication uh, influences perception. Language influences perception. 
and perception is the foundation for your thought and for your behavior. So fundamentally, communication influences your worldview. It influences how you view yourself, how you view others, and how you in, uh, view the various things that occur in life. And how you view influences how, uh, how you behave and how you interact. So it's, it, this is critical. And so certainly the critical theorist is going to be the one that's going to focus on this uh, ideological view because it's very much about power. Uh, it's certainly, many people would argue, the ultimate power. And a communication concept. This uh, discussion of race, a lot of interesting research that talks about race being more of a communication socially constructed concept than a reality. It, interesting research. Different functions of ideology certainly uh, presents a particular organizational interest, group interest, as um, universal and something that everybody should adhere to tries to minimize ambiguity or uncertainties in the contradictions that exist perhaps between an organizational or institutional view and the general view in society. I even think about some um, norms within the church and versus those norms and those values in, in the world and, uh, and how there's an effort to to show or explain those differences in order for people to be at peace with them. Um, not necessarily to minimize, to rationalize, but at least, at the very least, to attempt to explain uh, and reify social relations in terms of where you are in the big picture. Uh, so critical scholars um, study organizations as sites of power and resisting. Uh, the idea of power is that ideological struggle over meaning resistance is uh, those who don't want to be sort of absorbed into this corporate um, you know entity they want to maintain their own identity and they want to be separate they want to resist and looking at that uh, and the concept of uh, hegemony and the idea of, of unity and looking at that is also important. Identity, how much, how much, well, let's make it very specific. Cal Baptist is an organization. And how much and in what ways can you think of Cal Baptist as attempting to, in a sense, indoctrinate or rather simply encourage the view that you view yourself as a CBU student and that as a CBU student that means certain things there are certain implications as a CBU student how will you respond to X Y and Z how will you behave according to X Y and Z there are many ways that Cal Baptist like many organizations will work hard to have you embrace the identity of the corporate Okay. And Cal Baptist is no different. We do it fundamentally in Christianity. Uh, it, is, it is not a bad thing. <laughs> uh, many people are like, ah. But it's, it's fundamental to how you view yourself and then subsequently your behavior and how that will respond in this concept of identification. Uh, Dietz, that research is um, explored a little bit more in the area of corporate colonization and uh, like it says, corporations exist in all, all spheres of life. And education is a huge one. Religion is a huge one. Um, there are a number of different um, social organizations, corporate organizations. So. OK, and, uh, and then it continues. This idea of engineering culture, that has a lot to do with this can be manufactured. Um, it, can, it's very, um, it can be created and worked in order to control um, the worker to, in order to give them a sense of stability and some predictability in terms of their behavior. This idea of resistance, the idea of that, no, I don't want to be absorbed, and um, that's come up in a couple of different areas with some different research. Uh, some scholars will have focused on feminism and use that as a research in terms of looking at uh, different feminist theories that don't like this idea of conservative control. Um, they don't want, they don't fully take the identification and they want um, sort of to be emancipated as it will.
So, and there's a study that's given in some detail in this chapter on flight attendants as an example of this. Okay, and uh, then different forms of resistance, that's explained, and then here's your conclusion. So, that is chapter 7 in a nutshell, and uh, uh, 10 minutes, shorter than the other one was. So, I'll stop with this, and uh, wish you well, and I'll see you shortly with the next chapter.